on image quality. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, there is a way to get rid of this, right? Hide floating. There we go. Okay. I'm going to put myself up in the corner there. Sometimes I might use my hands. Right? Okay. So when you're when you're looking at a picture, how do you decide that a picture is a good picture or a crappy picture, a lousy picture? Right. That's it's essentially in medical imaging just as when you take a picture on your phone, and we're all photographers now, right? Because everybody's got an amazing camera in their pocket, right? Compared to the cameras I had when I was, you know, younger and buying Nikons and stuff like that, these things are ridiculously good cameras, right? And um, you, you hold that thing up and you go bang. And nowadays, everybody has a 4,000 by 3,000 array of pixel picture every time you go pop like that. And it costs nothing in memory and stuff. So we're in a in an era where everybody is a pretty good photographer, right? Those cameras usually have automatic ways of compensating for the fact that you can't hold your hand still or that the amount of light in a certain environment is a thousand times higher than another environment, et cetera. So it will adjust how it detects photons, you know, depending on the environment you're in. And it's precisely how medical imaging works as well. So when you want to uh, figure out if a picture is good or not, there's a couple of fundamental properties of the picture. One is what is the spatial resolution of the picture? And we're going to define that mathematically. And what is the signal to noise level of that picture? And so when you go into a very dark room, there are like thousand factors of a thousand less photons going into your camera, right? But the electronic noise in that camera stays the same, right? And so the ratio of the photons coming in, hitting the detector versus the random signal from the noise, that goes way down as it gets darker and darker, right? And so you get an image that has less quality, exactly the same in medical imaging. Right, you will have a noise source and you'll have a signal source, and that ratio is a fundamental component of what makes the image better or not. The other thing about medical imaging is that normally when you take a picture, you know precisely what you're trying to detect. You you're after a specific thing normally. Right? You don't just take pictures and say, let's just see what this looks like. There's The way a radiologist gets a request for an imaging study is usually a very particular question. And that question has to get answered. And so the question may be, is the coronary artery blocked? Right? What is the dimension of the coronary artery in terms of its diameter as we're looking at that? Is the myocardium in this patient, i.e. the muscle in the heart wall, of normal thickness, reduced thickness, or is it too thick, right? So there are these very special questions. And so we can design our imaging technique to answer those questions. And that's, so if you were training a learning algorithm, right? You say, what's the output? You wanna get that answer correct the maximum number of times. And so if that answer is, does this patient have coronary calcium? That's a binary answer. So you can train some, you can train a human to make the call by looking at the picture and then coming up with that binary answer, say, this person has calcium, right? And you just learn through feedback, right? And so humans are really good learning engines, right? We can figure stuff out after about three examples and all of a sudden you know what you're doing and, you, and off you go. Machines, on the other hand, take many more examples. However, you a human can't read 10 million calcium scans. A machine can. It will do it in an afternoon, right? So radiologists' days of being the primary engine for looking at the picture and, and coming up with a call, they're numbered, right? It's 
it, the writing is on the wall for that. It's just basically the radiologist will be the manager of this process to take the imaging information, feed it through an AI robot, and then interpret that result. Because the AI robot can look at every pixel and it's seen a million of these before, right? So just the way AI is taken over Go and chess and all of these other things, AI will take over image recognition and, and uh, differentiation of types of outcomes based on images. But we still need to give it good pictures, right? And so our job as physicists or electrical engineers, whatever, and we're making a new imaging technique is to give it a picture that has the best signal to noise, the best spatial resolution required for whatever task either a human or a robot is gonna do. Our performance will go up on both of those, in both those cases, right? So looking at spatial resolution first, you say, well, how do you quantify what whether an image is blurry or whether it's sharp? Right? That's the spatial resolution. If we took out our camera and we took a picture of a wall, right? That's a constant signal. We take that picture or we take a medical image. Uh, we get a certain background constant value with noise on top of it, right? Then we put a dot on the wall, a very small dot, right? So with a marker, I just mark the wall and then take another picture and ask, well, what does the picture of that dot look like? When I bring it up and zoom in and look at the dot, what does it look like? So if the dot's big enough, it's gonna look like a disc in my pixel array that's representing that dot. If I get a pen that's smaller and smaller and smaller until finally I put a dot such that it starts to go below the dimension that that imaging system can resolve, you will start seeing something that looks like this. As these pixels get smaller and smaller, eventually the object that you're representing doesn't get smaller. The, the resolution of the system passes the signal through such that it looks like this blob. This is usually characterized by a width, right? At its half height, you can characterize it that way. You can say, well, here's the peak signal from my blob. If this is a black dot on a white wall, this would be inverted, right? It would be a darker signal in the middle. Let's multiply by negative one. So we get a, a bright signal in the middle. And then as we move away in millimeters or in microns, right, spatially, the signal falls off. Right? The object itself looks like this. It's, it's quite small compared to the resolution of our imaging system. And this is what the imaging system puts out. It doesn't make sense to have an imaging system that produces a digital picture with one pixel that is up if you have something like that. You have too few pixels at that point. Pixels are cheap. You can make many more pixels, right? The thing that's expensive is making the width more narrow. That's like getting better optics or something like that. So this output of what is essentially mathematically a delta function, it's the, it's the smallest object you can make, right? In two dimensions, um, say on a CT scanner, this could be a, a tiny ballpoint pen bead. So what we do is we take those beautiful, you know, uh, pens that have like a 0.3 tip ballpoint in it. And you take that tip out, put it in the CT scanner and image that thing. And what you get is a, is a kind of a blob that looks like this, that gives you what's called the point spread function of that scanner. So the object is tiny and the image is quite a lot wider than that object in millimeters, right? This thing is called the point spread function of the system. This one is the two dimensional point spread function of, of an imaging system. And so that's how you quantify spatial resolution. If, if you can tell me what this function is, 
analytically, if you can write down the equation for what that function is, we have defined the spatial resolution of the system, right? So here's what it looks like, say from above, this is our black or dot that we put on the wall. It becomes a, a blurry thing. If we drew a very thin line down the wall, this is called the line spread function. And this could, you know, if you, if you need a, a two-dimensional representation of how it's blurring in each direction, uh, you can rotate this line. And then there's the, you know, edge response function, which if I have a step, if I have background and then I put a very sharp edge and color the next half of the wall black, then uh, this you know width of that transition is the edge response function. Okay. So here <clears throat> is an example of how you would uh, improve, say, the signal to noise of your system. Uh, if I have a, a picture, and so I'm enumerating the pixels in the picture along this way. Uh, so in, in 2D, they, it looked like this, but now I'm just going to click along in one direction and enumerate pixels. And this is the signal that I'm seeing as I walk along my image. And say this is the image of a just a background of the background of the wall or in a patient, this could be air. This could be a constant signal in the blood pool in the left ventricle, right? So all the blood should be the same signal intensity. And you find when you put a, a cursor through the picture of the left ventricle, you get this, you know, variability in signal intensity. Uh, you can trade off spatial resolution. Um, and noise. So when I look at, at this, I say, well, you know, I know this background is constant. So this stuff is noise, right? The, the variability here in my grayscale value in this picture is noise. So I would like to make this picture more like this, you know, so it's smooth, it's close to the mean value, it looks like a constant background. That would be terrific. And so to do that, you can do very simple algorithms. And that is, well, why don't we take every three points, we'll take their average value and we'll use that. And then take the next three points, plot that average value. The next three points, plot that average value. So I'm passing across the image three, you know, it's basically a window of three pixels and I shift it one pixel, take the average value, shift it another pixel, take the average value. And what that does is it reduces the amount of noise, right? So it turns this very noisy signal into this less noisy signal, right? That, that's appealing sometimes, and this is used a lot in medical imaging uh, because humans, when they're detecting things, are distracted by um, noise, by hashy noise, right? So even, even if the, the noise has no consequence for the detection task at hand, if it's there, it distracts the person. And so radiologists and cardiologists, when they look at pictures, will often turn up a knob that makes the image much smoother like the noise goes away, right? And the problem with doing that is you start blurring out objects that are small. So if you had one of, one of these signals was actually important, say this one was a tiny object, right? This guy here, so that's a tiny object. And you really want to say that's a significantly lower signal than the rest. It gets lost when you do this averaging. So you have to be willing to give up looking for tiny things when you do this. But for the most part, especially in those imaging techniques that require some kind of energy deposition in order to get your signal, such as 
computed tomography, single photon emission tomography, positron emission tomography, echo not so much, echo, you can heat the patient, but it's pretty hard to do. In MR, you can heat the patient with the radio frequency energy. So uh, you usually wanna keep it below the heating level of what you're putting into the patient. In all of those things, you want to get the a satisfactory image with the least amount of exposure to the patient. In CT, for instance, it's exposure to x-rays. So you, you can generate absolutely spectacular pictures that don't require any of this smoothing just by using more photons and your signal to noise will get better. The problem with that is as the number of photons increases, the deposited radiation dose to the patient also increases. And so you have to stop somewhere. You can't just keep going, right? And the modern um, approach to CT imaging is try and get a picture for as few photons as possible, right? And that has been achieved in the most part. Even in cardiac imaging, where you're imaging the chest and you're trying to image over the whole heart cycle or something, the average doses now that people uh, are exposed to for a, a study uh, equal about the background radiation you absorb in one year, just walking around, right? So you absorb radiation from cosmic rays and you absorb it from the ground, you know, with um, radiation that comes out of, out of basically out of rock. Um, and some basements, you have to have a vent system to actually get that radiation out of your basement. Um, and so that background radiation gives you about three millisieverts a year. Most cardiac scans now are done about three millisieverts. So it's just equal to the background. So this smoothing gets employed, right? Because you usually image such that the, the, back, the image that you've got is kind of noisy. And so you can design these filters that you pass over the image in order to smooth out noise. And here's a very trivial filter. This, this is a square window here. And we're gonna average one, you know, one, two, three, four, five points, and then plot that. Okay. And then there's more, there's filters that weight the central point more, or give more emphasis to the central value, but use the outside values to decrease the random noise. And then this filter actually will preserve some edges because of these negative lobes on the, on the outside. So these are, are basically passed across the image, the convolution kernels, and then the output is a smoother or a, a picture that looks like it has less noise and the spatial resolution has been smoothed. Um, and there, you know, there's a whole cottage industry in how to do this in more advanced ways such that if you come up to a very sharp signal, say a step edge, you, you perhaps adapt this kernel as you come up to that signal. So if, I, if I'm charging along through the heart and then I come to the heart wall itself and all of a sudden the signal drops by an order of magnitude, then I change the kernel, the averaging kernel as I'm passing across that edge and try and preserve the position of the edge. Right? These are very advanced filters and that in CT it's done a lot, right? Is this uh, filtering. So in, in, in some ways it would be an interesting project to, you know, look for optimal filter design. Um, I have a slide, I think we'll see it later where we look at signal to noise in three different vendors from CT and the pictures look entirely different and just in terms of what the background texture looks like and the sharpness of various edges and stuff. And the difference is the these kind of filtering or non when we go to nonlinear filters where the kernel changes as a function of position, you know, the engineers designed this really cool filter that gives you this 
picture that is a nonlinear representation of what, what you started with, right? It, it, you can't really do it using just Fourier analysis. So here's a simple 2D filter, which is just a Gaussian blob. And you would pass this Gaussian blob across the image. This kernel, if you pass this across the image, it will amplify discrete edge changes, right? And so you'll get an edge picture. And then you can go to higher, higher orders of change. But these filters, when you when you apply them, they, it tends to really amplify noise. And so these aren't used that often, except in sp special detection tasks. So here's an example of what happens as uh, you apply these filters. So here is the original picture. This is just a simple X-ray image of a of a knee, and if we pass a oh, let me do this, if we pass a Gaussian blur, which we saw on the last page, so we pass this thing across the picture and just move it one pixel at a time, and then average what's under that Gaussian we get something that looks like this. And so you can see some of these fine details up here get lost, right? The variability of the intensity also, it smooths out. And so we just get a blurry picture. This is our original. If we look at one of those edge enhancement filters, sorry about that, one of these guys, we say, okay, well, let's, let's like amplify the signal if I hit an edge, we get a picture that looks something like this. And so now we're starting to see brighter transitions between the background and the signal itself. And you know those transitions here are, are brighter. And then we do it even farther. We start seeing this very edge enhanced picture where we get high signal along all the transitions or a, high, or a large negative signal on this side. And so it's really amplifying that edge information. And it, you can keep going such that the background, the whole picture starts having the same value in the background, right? And the only thing that gets preserved are these big steps. And that's, an, that's basically an edge enhanced picture. This is useful on occasion when you're doing traditional segmentation. You wanna know where the edges are between one boundary and the next, yeah? So you move it. So the question, I'm going to repeat the question so we can. So it's a good question. It's like, well, if you're passing this one pixel at a time, how do you get different values um, as this kernel is moving along? So let's let's think of a kernel with five pixels as its input. And then each one of those pixels has a weighting associated with it. And so if we go back to this simple version here, um, as I, I have five pixel values and they're all multiplied by 0.2. And so my new pixel value is an equal weighting of each one of those values. Right, and so now, now I have a new pixel value at this position, which is an equal weighting of each one of those. Now, when I move that window one pixel over, I've I've dropped this image value and I've picked up a new one. So the operation changes one pixel. Correct. The... Absolutely. Sorry, I wasn't unclear there. The output of this thing is the pixel value at this middle point. Right, And then you click over one more pixel, compute a new value for that pixel only, click compute a value for that pixel only. You can imagine if we did it with a window that was the width of the entire image, then you would just get the average value for every pixel, right? And that would be the ultimate smoothing. It would just be with constant value. And then as it comes down, as that window gets narrower and narrower, we start, it's, it's the average value of a region. Right. And so this region is five pixels long. Sure. And then, you know, with these uh, gradient filters, we we can have an output that only has a positive value where there is a big step 
function value in the in the signal. And so if you want to amplify the edges, see where the edges are, then this is your, your filter. Linear filters, I don't know how many folks have come from an electrical engineering background, but convolution in the spatial domain is equivalent to multiplication by the Fourier transform of this function in the Fourier domain. And so another way of thinking about this is the picture that I'm going to achieve with this convolution, I can do the same thing by taking the Fourier transform of that picture, multiply that Fourier transform by the Fourier transform of this, which is a sync function, right? Which basically amplifies data that's close to DC and diminishes data that's out at high frequencies. So just make that multiplication, do the inverse Fourier transform, and that's my output. That is a linear filter. And that a lot of old school image processing is done with those linear filters. Nowadays, there's most of the time you use um, filters that are adaptable as they move around the picture. And so you can't do that simple Fourier analysis anymore. You, you can approximate that Fourier analysis, but you're at certain features in the image are not going to be replicated if you start changing the kernel as you're moving around the picture. So talking about Fourier analysis, let's let's take a look at coming to a visceral understanding of what spatial frequencies are uh, when we talk about uh, images. Um, this function here is an approximation of a square wave. Right, so it basically has a constant value for some period or half period, constant value. This is one full period of a square wave. And that any function, in this case, it's a one dimensional function, has a representation. If that function is continuous and, and well behaved, it has a representation with a Fourier transform. Right, and a Fourier transform is answers the question, how do I build this function from sine waves and cosine waves, right? Any function can be built from these sine and cosine waves. Again, the function has to have certain properties, right? But let's, let's take a look at how this works. We have a primary frequency here, which is sort of the distance, the primary period or one over the frequency is the distance between the center of this and the center of this. And then it, it just repeats, right? So that's a wavelength of a sine wave. In this case, let's look at this. This would be a cosine from here down to here, back up to here at that primary frequency. Okay? So we add that sine wave into a total summation that's going to come up with our function. Add this one. And then the next sine wave we're gonna, or cosine, is this one. And it has twice the frequency that this one did, right? Or is it three times? We got one, two, yeah, it's three times the frequency of this one, right? So we've got one and a half wavelengths here. We've got one, two, three wavelengths here. This one we had one. So this is a primary, and then we have this sine wave here, which is, has a frequency three times as high as this sine wave. And when we're going to add it into our sum, it has a lower amplitude. Right? So this plus this, and then here's one that we come back to one, two, three, four, five. So we now have one period, three periods, five periods of, of sine waves. So this one's now a cosine again. And then the neck and its amplitude is diminished. We add that in and we do it again. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? Oscillations in that period and the amplitude is diminished. We just keep doing that with the appropriate amplitude and the frequencies at one, three, five, seven, nine, 11, 13, just keep going in that way. 
we will achieve what is essentially a square function, right? This is pretty darn close, right? And we've only used one, two, three, four components and added those together. And that's the Fourier reconstruction of this function, right? Out to four terms. Uh, there's another interesting project would be how to teach AI to do traditional transforms on images. So if you if you had a, I mean, it's, you could do this probably in, in an hour, would be here, I'm going to train my uh, AI you know, network to take in a vector, right, of say 256 points, and its output vector will be the Fourier transform of those points, right? And you can generate truth, underlying truth data and, you know, training data. You could figure out how much training data do you need to get that network to get within 1% of the right answer, right? And um, who knows what's going on underneath in the black box of the, the coefficients in that network. But I bet you, you know, if you train it, you're, you know, do great. And then throw some signal in that has noise on it and see if it if the network itself does it blow up and just i i can't do this it just gives you the wrong answer all the time does it give you the least squares fit to the noisy data you know that would be kind of interesting so yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff to be done in ai and radiology to try and understand it, are some of these systems predictable where they will fail Right, because right now it's all empirical. You just train, 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 and then occasionally they just get it really wrong. <laughs> and there's no kind of way to predict when that's going to happen. Um, okay. So, the imaging system, when we're uh, quantifying it, remember we talked about the point spread function. So here's a two-dimensional point spread function. This is the signal from a tiny, tiny dot. That's what the point spread function is. If I have something that's smaller than my laser pointer, right? It's, it's 100th the diameter of my laser pointer. I put it here and I get this picture. That's the point spread function of the system. It blurred that tiny dot into this representation. And what that means, now that we understand that any function is a composition of Fourier components, you can ask the question, well, what does our imaging system do to a signal that is a sine wave? If I just wrote on the wall and I was a really good artist and I could draw a sine wave, a 1D sine wave on the wall and took a picture, you know, what does the picture look like? It's bright, dark, bright, dark, right? And then I put that into my imaging system and this is what comes out. So I get a representation of this sine wave. However, the amplitude of that sine wave is diminished slightly from the result I would get if I just put a constant signal in there, right? So if this green line was just a constant and I take an image and it comes out a constant of exactly the same amplitude, then you know it's past that zero frequency data. If I then make a more interesting image that changes as a function of position in space and push that through the imaging system, normally what the imaging system does is it, for a specific sine wave, it will cause a reduction in the amplitude of the output depending on the frequency. And so we look at our input. I, there's a problem obviously with this graphic. This is stolen from the, uh, the textbook. I mean, the problem is that this is a perfect square wave. It's not a sine wave at all. But anyway, if I look at a square wave of this spacing, which matches this spacing, so I have bright signal, dark signal, bright signal. And I come over here and say, what's the output? I draw a line through there and I, I get an amplitude. And the amplitude of the output is the difference between the trough and the peak. Okay, so that difference there is is the amplitude of my output. Now I increase the frequency of my 
input. So it's a stripe signal that has stripes that are closer together. Right? This imaging system actually diminishes that signal a lot more. And then when I look at my amplitude and I measure the trough and the peak, which is over here, the trough and the peak, it has been reduced by say 50%. Oh, I have this arrow here. That would be this one, right? Would be a closer example. And then as I get higher and higher frequencies, eventually my output is still the same frequency. It doesn't shift the frequency of the output. That's, that's an important thing for these linear systems. It doesn't do that. It just diminishes that frequency's amplitude. And so when I look at this one, and then over here, I say, well, where's my trough and my peak? The, the signals are very close together now, right? And so that output has been diminished and it's now down to 13% of the amplitude of the input. And you can imagine if you keep going and you higher and higher frequencies, eventually your output is indistinguishable from a constant value, right? There is no contrast left. So the system, is incapable of passing frequencies that are say higher than this one, right? And so that diminishment of the ability of the imaging system to pass signal that has contrast at that spatial frequency characterized is another characterization of the spatial frequency of the, of the spatial resolution of our imaging system. You can take these specific values like how much that sine wave was diminished and just plot them on a graph, right? As a function of the spatial frequency, right? And so this spatial frequency is four cycles, one, two, three, four cycles per millimeter, right? So here's the dimension of that. So it's going up and down. So, so we get four full sine wave cycles in a millimeter. And that's plotted out here at four, in cycles per milliliter at this value, 13%. This one is two cycles per millimeter, right? So I got, you know, one full cycle, two per millimeter. So I plot that at two cycles per millimeter and it goes down to 56%. One cycle per millimeter, one full sine wave, and it's plotted here at 87%. So if I did this for every frequency, right, I would get a continuous curve that looks like this. It just gets smaller as the spatial frequency, and this is called the spatial frequency, goes higher. Remember, spatial frequency is in cycles per millimeter. It's like a wave on the floor, right? So you've got a distance there, not a time. This function, when you know it, right, is called the modulation transfer function. And that is a definition that you want to remember right, that the modulation transfer function characterizes the ability of your imaging system to pass signals at specific frequencies. They don't all look like this, like a nice sort of Gaussian signal. Some of them have a flat top and then will roll off. But when you're characterizing an imaging system and say we're writing up the the pamphlet that we give customers for our imaging system. If the person reading the pamphlet is a medical physicist, what they'll look down all of the data and they'll find out what is you know this value. So they'll say at 10% of the MTF, what is my cycles per millimeter? And then that is an indication of the spatial resolution that this machine can achieve, right? You have to be careful because manufacturers decide on what this threshold is on their own. Some will give you 10%, some will give you 1%, right? And so that's, a, that's farther over here. And so it's better if you can just to look at this entire function, right? We don't really think terribly well in Fourier space, like cycles per millimeter, not People don't really think in that space terribly well unless you've been doing it a long time. And so the point spread function is often the go-to representation of spatial resolution. That is, if I had a dot, what does the dot look like? What is the full width at half max of this 
function, this Gaussian function. The, the wonderful thing about linear systems is that the Fourier transform of this thing is the modulation transfer function, right? And the four, inverse Fourier transform of the modulation transfer function is this function. Okay? So you can know either one. But I, I think it's important to have a concept of like, oh, as the stripes get closer and closer together, eventually I can't resolve them anymore. And you can see that uh, with your phone. When you take pictures with your phone, if somebody has a, a jacket or something on that has a very high reproducible pattern on it, you know, um, and they're at a far enough distance so that those rep the reproducible pattern hits a certain frequency, you'll lose it, right? That pattern will, will start looking pretty strange, right? And that's, that's when you're, you're out here. And so that, it, you know, it's a, viscerally, it's good to understand what it means, like these sine waves get diminished. I would recommend, uh, I think I have in, in the notes here and extra reading, uh, chapters on the Fourier transform. And, you know, when I was a grad student, uh, I, I took Fourier transforms in physics as an undergrad physics student, but I never really understood what the hell we were doing in physics, like why we we're doing this, et cetera, et cetera. And then in medical imaging, all of a sudden I clicked and the, the um, two books are Bracewell and it's the chapters in here. And then uh, the guy at Stanford, um, his name, he's, he's, his name escapes me right now. But if you read those books and you understand them 100%, your life is better, right? Because when you're walking around, you just look at things and you can see it in both the Fourier domain and the spatial domain or the time domain in the Fourier domain. So when you're thinking about music and you're thinking about stereo quality and not that anybody cares about sound quality anymore, but if you did, you know, you you think a lot about that in the Fourier domain as opposed to the, the temple domain. So if if you're a person who moves in both those dimensions, it's it's life's more fun. Um, this is a, a phantom. And when you're, say, a medical physicist and somebody says, well, what is the spatial resolution of our scanner? Like, let's just get down to brass tacks here and measure it as opposed to looking at the pamphlet and what they claim it is, let's put an object in the scanner and we'll measure the image quality of that object, right? When it when the image is, is made. And so this Phantom was built by a company and it's called the Cat Fan 500. And these are companies usually started by medical physicists that come up with really cool phantoms. And then they, come, they start a little company and everybody buys this Phantom. I don't know why it's called a phantom, but anyway, you you put it, you know, in a, in a reproducible location in your imaging system, and you take a picture every day, and see does do my pictures change from day to day? What is the spatial resolution of my picture? So this thing, uh, this is uh, a CT image of a phantom in which they have metallic, I think they're metallic uh, parallel bars. In, in the phantom in the direction that's going through the plane here. And then the bars get closer and closer together. Okay, and so you can machine these things such that they're very close together and they actually challenge the spatial resolution of your imaging system. You really want your phantom to go beyond what your imaging system can measure so that you can accurately measure where does it cut off, right? And so as if we put a line through these signals here, we would get bright, dark, bright, dark, and we would see what that height of that bright, dark is, and then just move around until finally we say, you know what, at this point, this is my cutoff. I, this is just a constant signal now. I know in there are these very thin metal bars that, are, that have gaps between them, but I can't see the gaps anymore. Therefore, I'm at the maximum spatial resolution this system can achieve. And so it's a nice way of independently validating what the manufacturer is trying to claim. And we zoom this up and this author of this paper, I, I put it here so you can just click on this, you'll go to the paper, is claiming that with 
standard filtered back projection CT scanning, they get this picture. With their filtered back projection plus their RSCMD, whatever that is, there's many, many things out there, they're going to get this picture and it's better. And so that they've somehow with this scanner fiddled around with the raw data such that they extracted more spatial resolution out of this system, right? And that that is often achievable because when you just use the reconstruction algorithm provided by the manufacturer, they usually have in there little bells and whistles that are smoothing things out, right? So it's not designed to perform at this spatial resolution because the images will look noisier. So they usually have this throttled back a little bit, right? And they won't tell you. The interesting thing about CT is oftentimes there's stuff they do under the hood when they get their raw data and they, they start manipulating their raw data and then they go off to reconstruct it. That information is generally regarded as trade secrets. It is not something that they write a patent on. And the reason it's a trade secret is because they are compensating for some kind of design trade-off in the system. How big do I make my detectors? How far apart do I put them? The, the things that are between detectors to stop crosstalk between detectors, how big should those be? So they make all of these trade-offs that they do not want to tell you about. Right? It's not sort of in a big diagram. Uh, and getting that information out of them is pretty hard in CT. Yeah. Oh yeah, you can you can usually uh, design phantoms to actually measure those things. So you say, you know what? I think I think their detectors aren't actually that size. And you go in and you figure out some way of you, know, you put a pinhole in in the system so that you can resolve what the say the um, you know, the source of x-rays, if you have a pinhole here, you get a picture of that source, right? Just through a pinhole camera. So you can actually visualize how they're making the x-rays and all that stuff. But oftentimes they won't just give you a white paper to tell you about that. Magnetic resonance, on the other hand, the manufacturers, very open. They, they will actually fly you to their manufacturing site, give you a week-long course on how to program their system. And this is a tradition in MRI that's been there since the 80s when I first started. And um, the CT market started in the 70s and it evolved into a totally different beast than the MR market, which is if you buy an MR machine and you're a place like UCSD, you buy it with the understanding that we're going to program this thing to do what we want it to do. Right. And so the manufacturer, you, you sign agreements and all that stuff, but but it's all part of the deal. CT, not so much. There's only a few sites in the world that have these really tight agreements with manufacturers. So here's, um, you know, other simple phantoms where you change the orientation of the parallel lines. In some imaging systems, the Resolution will be dependent on where the object is in the field of view. At the middle of a CT scanner, you'll get your hot, the highest resolution. Out at the periphery, you might get less. And uh, so these phantoms are designed with this. And here's one that's sort of a continuous separation with a spatial resolution in this direction, right? And it's sort of a theta direction. And then as we get closer and closer to the origin here, eventually that thing will just be a constant signal and so you can measure the the distance and that or the cycles per millimeter in that theta direction that you're going okay um the other uh phantom that is commonly used in computed tomography is called a contrast detail phantom and it's not one of my favorite phantoms i it's they went down this pathway i i think you could could uh describe things more clearly with a sim simpler thing, but this is what it's used, so you should know about it. Um, if we use a lot of x-rays such that we have a very low noise value, we can measure the mean value of a signal, say in this disk, 
quite accurately, and we can measure the mean value in the background. In, in the background is say water and this disc might be some plastic. And that gives you the contrast, the amount of signal difference between those two objects. And then if you image it with fewer photons, you get more noise in the reconstruction. Fewer still, you get more noise, right? And so this is called, this curve here is called a contrast detail curve. If you're inside, that means you have a very high probability of detecting that object. If you're outside, that means you really can't detect that object anymore. Okay. So you see that at very high signal to noise, regardless of the dimension or the contrast of the object. So the contrast is high in this row. The contrast is very low in this row. So this will be a harder detection task, obviously, in this row than this one. And uh, as we go down this way, right, you, you can see a diminishment in the probability of de detecting that thing. As we go this way, you know, detecting a big object is just simpler, right? Because you can average over a wider field of view, right? So at a certain noise level, we get this. We, we've lost this point, probably lost this point too. So it looks like that. And then at a even lower contrast to noise. So we've say used one-tenth of the photons we used to make this. One-tenth or even one-twentieth of the photons, something like that. We get this picture. These large objects, because they are large and you can average over their, you know, the disc, you see them quite easily as a human. Down here, even, even if I know where that object is, say this one here, I know it's there, right? So I go over here and I look. You, you can do as many measurements as you want there. And you are not going to get a significant difference between the background and that circle because the noise level is too high, right? And so it's just gone. And so this is often used to characterize a CT scanner, that, that contrast detail curve. And in making those measurements to decide if an object is detectable, we use this simple measurement technique, which is I take a mean value in my object that I'm trying to determine whether or not I can detect, right? And so here, let's say this blue curve are the pixel values, right? So this is my observed uh, mean of the pixel values in say this disc, right? So I just average all of the pixel values or let's make a histogram of all of the pixel values in this disc right here. So we're gonna make a histogram, right? That histogram looks like this, right? So there's a, a peak at its mean value, but there's also variability in those values. And that's characterized by this standard deviation or root mean squared deviation. And then I go back to my picture and I say, okay, well, I'm trying to detect this against this background. I want to determine if there's something there versus the background. So let's just take a histogram of all the background pixels, right? And that looks like this. So now I have a mean value of the background. I have a mean value of my target or the thing I'm trying to detect. And whether or not I can distinguish them is basically defined by these two distributions. As the distributions get closer together, that is the contrast goes down between my object and my background. You can imagine as it, as it goes in, the contrast goes down, eventually you can't determine that it's there, right? Characterizing what these distributions are is a very simple process, right? These curves, if there's enough pixels in your histogram, you can model that histogram with a normal distribution, right? And uh, the normal distribution is characterized by the mean value here, which is just this value, and this root mean square deviation, sigma, which appears here. So there's only two parameters, and I can tell you exactly what this curve looks like. And this is the equation normalized uh, 
such that when you integrate across this, you get one, right? Uh, so the mean value is just computed pixel by pixel. You add up every pixel, divide by the number of pixels, and that's your mean value. The variance, which is sigma squared, you take the difference between that mean value you just calculated and each pixel, square that, add those squared differences. You divide by n minus one because you used up one degree of freedom to get this mean value, and that gives you sigma squared. So it's pretty trivial. Every imaging package, when you look at pictures and stuff, will have a what's called a region of interest that you can just put a circle right here and it will tell you the mean value and the standard deviation right, of that background. And then you draw another circle, it'll give you the mean value standard deviation. And so that is essentially the contrast difference to noise or the contrast to noise is the difference divided by sigma. Thing. For most scanning systems, sigma of both these distributions will be about the same, right? Unless they're very far apart in amplitude. Uh, in MRI, if it's if you're doing simple reconstruction, these sigma values are the same everywhere. In CT, the sigma value actually does change with the signal amplitude. So if you get very high amplitudes, the sigma value will be quite different than, say, in the background. But we'll get to that. So here we go. We take a little box, measure the mean, measure the standard deviation, right? And this, take a box in the background, mean, standard deviation, right? And we can come up with a signal to noise value, right? So the mean of the background here, uh, I don't know, what is this? C and R in this figure, the disk running from left to right are 0.391, 1 1.3, and 1.7, right, is the contrast difference to noise. So the signal difference between this and this uh, divided by the amplitude of the noise is only 1.7, okay? So <clears throat> where you like to operate uh, is, is part of the interaction that you as a imaging scientist and the radiologist or cardiologist who's going to read our scans, you guys have to figure out where do you operate, right? Uh, if we do, you know, twice as many photons, this noise is going to be diminished by a factor of root two, and then that contrast to noise will get better. Is that where you want to operate, like 1.7 times root two, or is 1.7 okay? Um, I am going to skip the Poisson distribution right now because we're we're short on time. Uh, and then here, here's the contrast to noise of a half, looks like this, of one and two, right? And these are, if we plot the values along this arrow, we just look at our signal and you can see it, the mean value goes up in the rectangle and goes back down. In MRI, the noise at each signal level is equivalent, right? In CT, as we go up in signal level, the noise actually goes up with us, right? And so that when you do contrast to noise, you have to say, well, we'll probably use this noise value, right? Estimate over here. And these are uh, examples of image quality. Let me, oops. And I didn't want that. I wanted to get rid of this thing. So is it arrow? Yeah, there we go. Sorry. So here's here's a field of view that looks just like noise, right? So this noise is it's called white ergodic noise. And the reason it's white is it has every frequency is in the noise uh, signal. And ergodic because it doesn't change in time. Each, each instance of noise over time is gonna look identical to the next. And, oh no, didn't work. Oh, I didn't test the movies beforehand. Okay, maybe the next one will work. And so this is what that signal, if I look at the signal to noise here, here's my actual signal. And I look at it, you can see 
you know, when you plot through it, oh yeah, there's a signal there. Your eyes also can integrate to make this uh, uh, value visible. Now, let's see, oh, here we go, good. Okay, so now here's an ergodic or a, a white ergodic noise field, but it actually does have a signal in it, okay? And it's very difficult to perceive the signal until you take multiple copies of this thing and the signal is actually moving. Now it's pretty simple, right? You can see that, that thing there. And the reason is your eye is integrating over the rectangle and the motion of the rectangle is also keying your brain, your eye brain to actually see that, that object. When you stop it, it kind of disappears, right? And, and so the, the ability to see it sometimes depends on other things than just the signal to noise, okay? And this happens in cardiac imaging a lot because in cardiac imaging, oftentimes we have the opportunity to make movies. Right? And so we make movies of the heart and many, many times the detection of something that you're after is much easier in the moving picture than it is in a stationary picture. And th this comes up again and again in all imaging, particularly echocardiography. Echocardiography, any single frame you look at looks pretty terrible, right? But in echocardiography, you can image it 30 frames a second. And so when you're looking at a dynamic movie of 30 terrible images a second, all of a sudden you have a pretty good movie, right? And so it, it really matters that you have temporal information in some of these as well. So there's the, the signal. In fact, that signal that was moving across the field of view, the only thing different with that signal, it wasn't a mean value shift of the square. It was just a reduction in the RMS inside the square. So it had the same mean as the background, but it, but it had lower RMS, lower noise, and it was moving. And so there, there is no difference in the mean, but you still saw the signal, right? So quickly, we're gonna look at the difference between precision and accuracy. Precision, if I, if I take, you know, here I've got five measurements, right, with my machine, and they're clustered around a mean value here, and they're very tightly clustered. I get the same measurement pretty well every time. Um, it's not pen. It's a laser here. So here's my mean, and I get a very tight distribution, so I get close to the same measurement every time. If I plot a histogram, I have a mean value and then a really tight estimate around that mean value. That's called high precision. The width of, you know, if I do 100 measurements and I look at the histogram of those measurements, if they're really clustered tightly, say that's high precision. Turns out not to be high accuracy in this uh, example because here's the, the target. That's the true value that we're, say, measuring out of this system our system is giving us this value. Now, this bias in the value, we can just train ourselves to recognize that there is a shift in the actual values, but we get reproducible values. So this you can get rid of by just subtracting that bias out of it. In this system, if I take the mean value of all these, I get the correct answer. Right. However, any one value is not worth a heck of a lot because it has so much noise on it, right? And so they in, in this system, when I just take one instance of it, I can be anywhere around here. So it's, it's less useful because I have low precision. If I take 100 measurements and take the mean, I have high accuracy in terms of what our target value is, right? And so... This is kind of the worst case where you have low precision and you're biased, right? And so your, your system is giving you values that are, are off. But again, you can get rid of the bias if you know what it is. Precision, that's, it's harder. And so here's an example of, these are, you know, there was uh, 150 stress echo cases. And I, if we think back to the first lecture, you saw those echo movies, right, of the heart beating. Stress echo means you put the patient under stress and you see if their heart changes, 
does it beat in a strange way when they're under stress? If it does, they're positive. They have disease, right? So 150 of these cases were given to uh, five different centers. And those experienced echo readers were asked, give us who's positive, who has heart disease because their heart's moving differently, and who is negative, i.e. their heart did not change between rest and stress. So in one center, 102 were estimated to be positive. In the neighboring center, 62 of the same cases. In the neighboring center, 38 were thought to be positive. In this center, 71. In this center, 59. So we have a big problem here, right? If we're evaluating whether or not our imaging system is doing well, right? And we have this much noise on readers, not in our imaging system, the images are the same, but this noise is the readers. We have to figure out a way of evaluating systems without being uh, tied to one center or one reader because they will do a different job. Okay. All right, great. So we'll see you on Wednesday.